What is the review process once a study is done to get a paper published in a journal? So, you know, once the, once the study is done and they've done their analysis and they write up a manuscript, they'll, they'll submit it to a journal for publication. And, and that, that journal will have an editor uh, who will, you know, look to see if the, you know, paper meets their criteria. Um, and if they think it's, you know, original and interesting, right? It, uh, is this, is this paper adding something to the body of knowledge? Um, at that point, the editor might just say, you know, Hey, this is not really a good fit for our journal or for whatever reason, this is, you know, something we're not interested in any further. You, you're free to go and submit this elsewhere. Um, but otherwise the editor is going to invite individuals that are typically part of a, an editorial board to, to peer review the manuscript. So you, you hear this term all the time, right? Which is, is this a peer reviewed publication? And that's important because not all things that get published have been peer reviewed. And that's obviously the highest standard. So the um, reviewers are basically invited, not randomly, but because they have some expertise in this area. Uh, but other things are important, right? You know, you have to consider the conflicts of interest um, and that they might have to decline if they're conflicted. Uh, and that's that's kind of a sticky topic because there are some really obvious conflicts like um, you know financial conflicts of interest. But I think I think there's a whole deeper discussion about when you have sort of philosophical conflicts of interest with the person, and that gets into another area, which is peer review can be um, blinded or or not blinded. Right? It can be single blinded, where the reviewer knows who the author is, but the author doesn't know who the feedback is from. That tends to be very common. I think that's probably the most common one I've seen. They can be double blinded, where the reviewer doesn't know who it's being written by and vice versa, and they can be completely open. Um, but again, the, the most common one that I've seen is, is single blinded. Um, and, and so you'll typically have three reviewers review something and they can either accept it outright, reject it outright, or make recommendations for revisions. And I, again, I, I, I think you'll see that as probably the most common thing where they say, you know, uh, we're, we're still interested in this paper, but you know, did you did you actually consider this hypothesis? So sometimes the revisions are just repeat your analysis. Sometimes it's do another experiment. Uh, that won't be the case in a clinical trial, but if you're, you know, I, I've had papers where that happened, where I had done a series of experiments and I'd written it all up and I'd submitted and the reviewer came back and said, well, you really should have done this experiment as well. Um, cause this would have served as another control. So you go and repeat that experiment. Mm -hmm. Of course, when you're working in cell culture or something like that, it's not, it's not that onerous. Um, but, and this process can go on several times, uh, but ultimately, you know, the editor makes a decision to um, accept that paper and publish it or reject it again. And that, and that's basically the process. And, and again, you, you're typically going to start at the, at the top of the food chain. So you're typically as a, as a, as an author, you're going to try to get your paper published in the most prestigious journal. Um, I guess that's something we can talk about what determines, what, what determines the prestige of a journal. Um, but you'll, you'll, you'll sort of keep going down the pecking order until you can get it into the right journal. And, and sometimes right out of the gate, you just sort of know like, Hey, this is, this is a, this is a publication that is really mechanistic and it's really going to be geared towards, you know, proceedings of the national Academy of science versus something that has really got enormous clinical, um, implications and should go to JAMA or the New England Journal of Medicine. So, so there's, there's a little bit of that that's going on as well. Mm. So, so to that end, do all every study that's that's out there do they end up getting published? No, uh, in fact, many don't. And this is, I think, this is a really big problem, which is, um, you have this thing called publication bias. So, there's a very, very famous example of this that you and I have spoken about, which is the Minnesota Heart Study, right? And this is an example where a study was done. Um, God, it was. It ran from what, 1967 to 1973, if my memory serves me correctly. I think so. And it was looking at people who were in a residential care facility. So they had complete control over what these patients ate and they were randomized to a diet of either normal saturated fat consumption or very low saturated fat consumption where the saturated fat was substituted with polyunsaturated fats. And at the end of this seven year study, of course, the hypothesis being the group that was substituted saturated fat for polyunsaturated fat would have lower cholesterol levels and lower uh, cardiovascular death rate. And at the end of in 1973, when the study concluded, 
they found that indeed the subjects who were given high amounts of polyunsaturated fats and low saturated fats did in fact have lower cholesterol levels, but their rates of cardiovascular deaths were, were significantly greater. Um, and they didn't publish the study. Uh, that study would remain unpublished until 1989, some 16 years later, um, when asked why a 16 year delay in publishing that study, the lead author, who's, I don't even remember who it was, Fran, uh, begins with an F. I think it's Ivan, Ivan France. Yeah. Uh, France, Ivan that's France. right. Yep. There's a, there's a senior and a junior. Yeah. 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 Uh, he said the study didn't turn out the way we wanted it to. So that's, that's kind of an <laughs> egregious example of publication bias. Um, in this case, a negative study, but you know, I think there are a lot of studies that don't get published, even if they're negative. And that's a shame because when something doesn't work, it is just as important as when it does work. So it is unfortunate that not all studies get, get published. Um, because again, just think about it this way. If you want to go out and do an experiment and 10 people have done that experiment before you, and it's always failed, wouldn't it be great to know that? Would that impact your decision on whether or not you want to do the experiment a certain way, or would you want to try something a little bit different? So you can see very quickly, this becomes problematic when, when papers don't get published. Okay. Are there, so you've got this massive problem, publication bias. Do you know of any ways that, that can combat this? I think there are a lot of people working on this problem. Um, and, and I think, um, one of the important steps is pre-registration, which we talked about at the outset, right? Which is you force investigators to pre-register their experiments on clinicaltrials.gov so that, and, and that just, that's not just, here's my experiment. It's here are my statistical methods. Here is my, uh, number of subjects. Here's my primary outcome. Here are my secondary outcomes, et cetera. And that basically makes it a lot harder to say, I'm not going to publish this when it comes out if it doesn't turn out the way I wanted it to. Hmm. And I think, I, and I don't know if there are particular journals that participate in this, but I, I imagine that they could, they could make it a, a prerequisite that your, your trial must be pre-registered in order to be published in our journal. And if it's a journal, you know, worth publishing in, it's probably not a bad idea. Correct. Um, so there's, there's both requirements of journals and there's also requirements of funding entities, which say mm. you're, you can't, we won't fund you unless the study is pre-registered. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, registered reports is a, is a publishing format that an organization called the center for open science. And I think that's the one founded by, um, Brian Nosak. Is that his name? I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah, Brian would be a great guy to have on the uh, on the podcast actually at some point. Mm -hmm. So with registered reports, um, it 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 pulls back basically. You submit your protocol, almost like the pre registration. You submit that, and at that point, instead of after all the data is collected, it's peer reviewed. And if it's peer reviewed and accepted, um, based on you've got a high qual high quality protocol, everything looks good, um, then it's provisionally accepted for publication. And so, like you said, like if it's a negative result and, and maybe that doesn't seem like it's worth publishing or a, a journal is not going to publish it, they're basically making a decision. If this is a positive or a negative trial, whatever, it, however it turns out, your, your protocol, your plan looks really good. And so we're going to accept it. We're going to basically accept it provisionally, provided that you don't, you don't start cutting corners and go away from this plan that we accepted. So you follow your plan and it's like, however the cards fall, it's already been accepted for publication. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a pretty novel concept actually. Um, but again, I think it's all in the spirit of how do we make sure that we get rid of publication bias, positive result bias. Again, going back to what we said a second ago, you're far more likely to see something get published if it is a positive finding than if it's a negative finding, although negative findings are, are just as important for the establishment of knowledge, right? Let's use the CTEP inhibitor. Yeah. Imagine no one had ever published the studies demonstrating that CTEP inhibitors were at best neutral, at worst harmful. Um, again, studies of that magnitude can't escape publication, but think of all the bench research that can be going on or the small early phase one trials that can be going on or the preclinical stuff that's going on. Uh, it's very easy to kind of, um, under report things that are, that are negative. 